Coaches Direct presents Legends of the Game. Learn football fundamentals from the top college coaches in the country. Frank Beamer, Bobby Bowden, John Cooper, Frank Solich, Bob Toledo, Joe Paterno, Boyd Epley, Mac Brown, Philip Fulmer, and Tom Osborne. Virginia Tech's Frank Beamer is one of the most respected and successful coaches in all of college football. Beamer has accomplished what most coaches just dream of, turning his alma mater into a national power. Beamer was an outstanding defensive back at Virginia Tech in the late 60s and a captain of the Hokies 1968 squad. After working his way up in the coaching ranks, Beamer returned to Blacksburg, Virginia in 1987 as the Hokies' new head coach. Ten years later, Frank Beamer was already the winningest coach in school history. Yeah. Building a college football program into a national powerhouse is a daunting task. Many try, few succeed. Frank Beamer is among the few. The Hokies began to make waves on the national level in the early 90s. In 1990, Tech was ranked in the top 25. In 93, the top 20. And then in 1995, Virginia Tech captured the Big East title, won the Sugar Bowl, and were ranked among the nation's top 10 teams at the end of the season for the first time in school history. And Frank Beamer was just getting warmed up. The Hokies added Big East titles again in 1996 and 1999, playing in seven straight bowl games in the process. But it was 1999 when Virginia Tech truly entered the realm of the elite in college football. The Hokies completed an 11-0 regular season and played for the national championship against Florida State in the Sugar Bowl. Tech narrowly lost to the Seminoles, finishing the year as the number two team in the nation, and Frank Beamer was named the National Coach of the Year. One of the chief reasons for Virginia Tech's phenomenal rise in college football has been Beamer's attention to special teams. The Hokies have a national reputation for special teams play. In fact, they blocked more kicks in the 1990s than any other team in college football. In this video, Beamer shares with you the fundamentals of special teams play used at Virginia Tech. Along with three of his top assistant coaches, Beamer will take you through all aspects of special teams play. Kicking, punting, blocking, and covering. In fact, this is the most comprehensive special teams video ever made. And it's taught by one of the nation's best teachers, motivators, and coaches, Frank Beamer, a true legend of the game. It takes offense, defense, and kicking to win football games. As an assistant coach and a head coach, I work directly with the offense. I work directly with the defense. I've called offensive plays. I've called defensive plays. But now, I work directly with the kicking game. And the reason why, I believe it's the quickest way to win a football game. The kicking game affects two things which greatly determines winning and losing. One, field position. Two, momentum. Let's talk about field position. We know that the further away an offense starts from the goal line, the more difficult it will be to score. Conversely, the closer the offense starts, the easier it will be to score. Our field chart clearly shows the difference. The significance of this information is simply that we can utilize the kicking game to give our opponents poor scoring percentage and enhance our own scoring percentages. For example, on kickoffs, if we can start an opponent inside their own 20-yard line, their chance of scoring is going to be 1 in 30. On a punt, if we return it to their 40, we have a one in three chance of scoring. And so there's, there's always points and there's always yards involved in the kicking game. So therefore you have big plays, momentum plays. If a team is aligning to kick a field goal and defense blocks it and scores, there's a difference of nine points. Three that the offense didn't get and six that the defense did get. Big difference. For every 10 yards you get in the return on the kicking game, it's a first down that the offense doesn't have to get. If a team's punting, say they're punting from their 40-yard line, uh, defense blocks it and scores. It's a difference of 80 yards, 40 for the average carry of a punt and 40 for the uh, yards that their defense uh, returned it. And it's six points. It's big momentum plays. 
I think it takes great athletes with good football sense to be successful in the kicking game. So much of special teams is in the open field, so good judgment has to be there. To block a kick, to block or tackle someone in the open field, you've got to be a good athlete. In this video, we're going to talk about particular skills involved with special teams, the punting, the kicking, the snapping, the holding, the catching. We're also going to talk about uh, blocking kicks, special techniques that we teach here at Virginia Tech. Finally, we're going to go through our special teams and give you some thoughts about special situations there and some special thoughts on that. You know, it's not hard to get people to, to talk about offense or talk about defense. And a lot of people talk about special teams, but sometimes people don't uh, spend as much time on it as, as probably it deserves. Uh, you know, you say it's uh, offense is a third of the game, defense is a third of the game, special teams is a third of the game. But in reality, I think special teams is more than that in terms of winning. It, it gives you the greatest opportunity to win the quickest of any of the three. So that's why we spend a lot of time on it here at Virginia Tech. It's why I'm actively involved with it at Virginia Tech. It's big plays. It's momentum plays. It's a lot of yardage. Anytime you line up to kick a football, all those things that are enter into it. So uh, for that reason, we spend a lot of time on it here at Virginia Tech. When we look for a special team player, it's not necessarily a second team guy or a third team guy, a guy that's not going to get in um, in other situations. We look for the very best guy to do that job. And, and generally, you're talking about good athletes with good judgment. It takes a good athlete to play special teams. Uh, you're out in the open field a bunch. Uh, you can't block a kick unless you're a good athlete. Good hand-eye coordination. You can't uh, tackle guys in open field unless you're athletic. Uh, you can't break tackles unless you're athletic. So all these things take uh, good athletes. And I think it takes good football sense, good common sense, because again, you're in open field and quick decisions are having to be made, uh, right on the uh, moment decisions. So if you don't have good judgment, uh, good sense about football, a lot of times you're gonna make the wrong decision. You know, to put a good football team together, it takes so many pieces of the puzzle and they gotta fit. And, and, and the people that play special teams are a vital part of that puzzle. They're the ones to me, the guys that go down and cover those kickoffs, the guys that go down and make tackles on punt returns, the guys that block for field goal protection. These are the guys, the ones that do it very well, the ones that are, are really people that really care about winning. I can tell you this, when I look at a recruit out of high school, I want to see him on a special team. You know, I watch him on offense or I watch him on defense, but I ask the coaches, I say, say show me a, a picture of this guy playing special teams. Show me a picture of him running down on a kickoff, because if he's got great hustle, great effort during that time, you can rest assured this guy is going to give you great effort, great hustle. I tell our guys here, it's a great way to get to the NFL. I think most college guys want to get to the NFL. Well, most of the times those guys are not going to go up and be a starter that first year. So if they can block a punt better than those other guys, it might be the difference in making a team or not making a ter uh, team. If they can protect uh, on, on kickoff returns, if they can block on kickoff returns, then it might be the difference. So if you can play special teams well, it might be your ticket to the NFL. When you, when you look at special teams, uh, in my opinion, uh, it, it's, it's one of the greatest things uh, about football. It may not have the same attention as offense, it may not have the same attention as defense, but in terms of winning and what it takes to win, this is really where it's at. In this tape, we're gonna try to give you a lot of different things about special teams. Some of the individual skills, how to kick a ball, how to punt a ball, how to hold a ball, how to catch a ball, you know, the different skills that's involved. Plus, I've got some coaches, and what I have here is a, a great coaching staff that's, that's very involved in special teams. Some of them have come from other staffs and have worked directly with the special teams there. Danny Pierman uh, is going to be with me today. Bud Foster, who's been uh, very knowledgeable in special teams for a long time. Brian Steinspring. Guys on my staff here that's going to help me present to you some of the things we do within our special teams plays uh, here at Virginia Tech. Hi, I'm Danny Pierman tight end assistant offensive line coach here at Virginia Tech. Also have the privilege of working with our kickers here. Uh, want to take time to introduce you Shane Graham. He was a kicker here at Virginia Tech, all Big East. Does an excellent job for you. I'd like to go over five basic principles we believe in that our kickers should do to be successful. First off, let's start Shane with a stance. Shane's going to align in a balanced stance. And the key to being a good kicker, one of the basic things is balance. 
Notice his nose are over, is over his toes. The weight of his body is on the ball of his feet. He's relaxed, but most importantly, he's in balance. Second thing that's important is his approach. He's relaxed, he's in rhythm, he takes a momentum step, and he, and he approaches the football. Very similar to a golfer, he swings a golf club. He wants to be smooth, he wants to be in rhythm, he takes a momentum step, and here he goes. Next thing we talk about is visual perception. It's very similar to the way a pilot flies a plane, the way he trusts his instruments, that there's a runway there. This kicker's trusting that the snap's gonna be there, the hole's gonna be there, and he's gonna be able to deliver the kick through the target or the uprights. Okay, next thing we'd like to talk about is the actual plant or his plant foot as it approaches the football. What he wants to do is go heel and kind of roll through it. Notice there too, as he rolls through it, he comes out with a skip. The plant, we like to use words such as firm. He wants to be firm and secure that it doesn't slide or that he slips because this allows his hips to pivot. Again, he goes heel to toe and skips through it. Once he gets his plant foot down, his hips get square to the target and is able to drive the ball through the goal post. For instance, if he were to plant too far in front of the ball, he would leave his hips open and have a tendency to push it to the right. If he would plant too far behind the ball, his hips would be closed and he'd have a tendency to hook it or snatch it or kick a knuckleball to the left. He wants to be square and flush on impact with his hips directly towards the target. Next, let's talk a little bit about the actual strike of the football. Going back and talking like we did earlier on visual perception, He's already, he's already made in his mind exactly where, where he wants the ball to go. As he plants, he sees where the ball is. The ball's planted, he's got his target, he keeps his head down. Now he strikes the football with the inside of his foot. Important things to remember in striking the football is his head down and making solid contact with the ball. This is a little drill we do to loosen up before we actually kick. It's just a plant drill where he, just to work on his technique and form. Probably as big a part of kicking is the follow through. That he's able to keep his momentum driving through the football and finishes. His ability for distance and leg speed come from his follow through. He stays down on it driving through the football and finishes much like a golfer does on his golf swing. He needs to finish through the football as well. Along those lines of his follow through, his head stays down. He doesn't look up towards his target. He keeps his eye on the ball and driving down through it. And putting it all together, the battery of the field goal team obviously is our snapper, our holder, and our kicker. They all must act as one in order for us to be successful. I think the thing that uh, really is important is that our kickers compete during the week. Uh, it's a very difficult thing to run into the game cold and kick, and that, for that reason, we try to very much get our kickers to compete during the week. We'll bring them out here, and we'll go to different parts of the field and have competition so they're kicking with a purpose and they're just not out here kicking. We don't kick a lot. We, uh, about 25 kicks a day, get your rhythm down, get the motion right. If you've got the thing right, you don't need to just keep kicking. Uh, we'd rather have them fresh on Saturday, have a nice live leg. So our theory is uh, get your rhythm right, kick uh, till you feel like that's correct, and then stop. In this segment, we're gonna talk about something that uh, a lot of people don't teach, but certainly we uh, take care of all the details here at Virginia Tech. And one, something that is tremendously important in the operation of a field goal kick, and that's holding for the kicker. I want to introduce to you Caleb Hurd. He's held for Shane Graham here for four years and uh, knows a lot about holding for uh, holding a football. So, Caleb, let's start out with the uh, uh, position that you're going to catch the ball and holding the football. So we'll go to that right now. The receiving position that we teach is for the holder to have his left knee up. And why I think this is important, it gives a reference to where the ball is going to be placed. In other words, when the left arm comes back and hits the knee, that's what gives you a reference as to where you're going to put the ball down. And one thing that's really important here is consistency. Do the same thing over and over. The ball is going to go to the same spot over and over. So by having that knee up, that left uh, elbow hitting it, now you have a reference for where the ball is going to go. I think the next thing, uh, Caleb likes to hold with uh, his left hand down to where he's going to put the ball, 
putting his right hand out to tell the center he's ready to catch it. And that's fine. He likes this because now he has movement as the ball is coming. Everything's not stationary. The other way of holding is to have both hands out and, and to be ready to catch the ball in that regard. But I think the one thing that is important is that your hands are nice and loose, just like a receiver catching a football. You don't want to be tight and tense. They need to be nice and loose and, and getting ready to catch it. The next thing after we catch the football is to make sure we get the seams in front when the ball is on the ground. And that uh, assures us that the ball will be kicked in an accurate fashion. In other words, if you get the seams on the side, the longer the kick, the more those seams affect the flight of the ball. We want a true trajectory on that football. So as, as Caleb catches the ball, and he'll even spin it to get that seam in the proper spot. And that becomes a feel thing. Uh, you, you really catch it, you feel those seams, now you move them to the front. The more you work with a snapper and the more the distance is the same, the more that snap is going to come to you the same way. So all these things goes into the consistency of kicking. And the ball's got to go down to the same spot every time. Next thing is that Caleb does this very quickly but calmly. The longer that ball's on the ground, the longer that kicker can see his sweet spot where he's actually trying to hit that ball. So the quicker it gets down there, the better. Next, let's talk about actually holding the uh, football. We want to do this primarily with the index finger. We'd like to fold the other fingers there on the left hand, get them out of the way. We don't want anything bothering the vision of the kicker. And the right hand gets out of the way. So the only thing that's touching the football is basically the index finger, so he's got a good view of his sweet spot. And then the last thing is don't let go. Make sure you got that finger, that index finger, on that football until the kicker actually kicks through and hits the sweet spot. My name is Bud Foster. I'm the defensive coordinator and linebacker coach here at Virginia Tech. Like many of the other coaches, I also am involved in the special teams. We understand it's an important part of the success of our program. Uh, today, I'm going to talk to you about the, the base fundamentals and elements of punting the football. Uh, who I have with me today is uh, Shane Graham. Shane was an outstanding uh, place kicker for us and uh, was a backup punter for us as well in our program and was an all-league performer and uh, really an outstanding uh, per performer for us here at Virginia Tech. What I want to do is talk to you about the six phases or six elements that we emphasize in our punting game. The first uh, segment that we're going to talk about will be our stance. Like any, any position, uh, you know, we talk about with our punters and, and with our kickers, we're going to treat them the same way as we treat you know, any other position on the field. And it, everything starts with a good stance. Now, the thing we talk about, we really talk about two different stances that we'll use. Number one, we'll talk about with our shoulders uh, being square and feet uh, will be shoulder width apart. We want our feet parallel, toes pointed to the line of scrimmage. We want a good bend in our knees, in our waist, and we want to put our, our nose over our toes with our hands relaxed down away from our body, with my eyes up looking at the snapper. The next stance we talk about would be our staggered stance. Okay, in this stance what we would do, we'd take our kick foot and we could stagger it with our toe to instep or toe to heel behind or we could take our foot and place it in front of our plant foot, whichever the uh, kicker feels more comfortable with. But again, we'd have our toes pointed down the field. We want to have a good bend in our, our knees and our waist with our arms down relaxed and our head up looking at the center, looking at the ball. Now, the next segment we want to go into is uh, one that's probably overlooked and taken for granted, but is the ball catch. Uh, the ball catch primarily, the, the key to the ball catch and, and part of the stance is having your hands relaxed away from your body, but now that allows your hands to go up and reach the, reach the ball. What we want to do is catch the ball in our hands, not catch it in towards our body, but extend out, catch it in our hands, have soft hands, but also now we want to have the expedience of catching the ball and now turning the ball to where the seams are now, or the lace rather, pointed directly up in the air. Now let's just talk about arm position and the placement of the ball uh, as you get ready for your drop. Okay, number one, we don't want to have the ball in our palm. We want to point the end of the football into uh, our palm, but notice we're also holding the ball with our fingertips. We want to extend our arm, but have a slight flex in the elbow, all right? And now what we want to do is we want to point this elbow towards the outer part of our kicking leg. Now what that does, it may feel like that ball, that elbow is outside, but what that does is it 
it places the ball directly above your kicking leg with the laces pointed to the sky. The most important phase uh, of the punting aspect is the drop. Uh, the drop is the one that uh, kind of makes or breaks a punter. It needs to be the most consistent element. The key with the drop is, again, now what we want to do, the, our pressure is with our fingertips. Uh, we want to drop the ball so that the laces are up and that the ball will drop and, and land on the fat part of the football. Now, the key to it is, too, we like to teach, a, uh, as you notice, we're teaching a one hand. You know, we like to teach that instead of two hands because we feel two hands has a tendency now when you have two involved, you have a tendency to pull the ball, or now you have a tendency to, uh, with the other hand, may lift uh, the point end up or drop the heel one way or the other right there. That's a good drop right there. The next element that we're going to talk about is the contact. All right, the ball contact should may be approximately two to three inches above the knee, all right, which would be approximately two and a half feet uh, off the ground. We want to make sure, too, with our contact that our, our toe, our foot, and our ankle are fully extended. And we want to make sure that it's, it's extended on contact and through contact. The last segment we're going to talk about is a leg swing. The key to the leg swing is what we want to do is have the leg swing in a straight path. Now, the thing that we like to do is we like to work down the line. We have a series of drills that we'll do. Uh, with our leg swing down the line and also in our, in our, when we're practicing our punting, we'll work down the hash or down the line. So the thing we like, want to make sure that we, we're seeing here again is that his foot is cocked, his toe, foot and ankle are extended. We want to work, make sure that his swing is right down the line and that he has proper extension and his knee should come up to his right eye in this situation. Now, to end it up, I'd like to show you a couple of drills that we use for our punters that they implement and, and work on every day. The first is just a ball drop. And what we like to do is they can do it stationary, just standing there, sticking the, extending their hand and dropping the ball. We, they can do that on their own anytime. Ideally, what we like them to do as much as possible is go through their steps to where they're moving and now drop the ball. And what we like to do is work it down the line right here so that way they can work a, a, across the field. And then they can work as a, a number of drops every day. We like them to work at least a minimum of 50 drops a day to where they can at least be consistent with their dropping because we feel that is the most important part is the drop. Now, another drill that we will use would be our down the line drill, which uh, you saw that in our leg swing. But basically, we're going to work down the line, working across the field with a leg swing. The next element that we do, we'll tie it all in together. We can now work our ball drop and leg swing all at the same time. All right, finally, what we're going to do is put it all together. We're going to tie in good stance, good extension, good drop, all right, and then good extension with our leg swing. During uh, the season, we have an in-season routine that we use with our punters. We don't want them during the day kicking more than uh, 25 balls per day. The reason being is we don't want them to out kick their leg, make themselves leg weary, but also we want them spending time working on the fundamentals, but not always working kicking the football. You know, one thing that we do is we time all of our our kicks. Ideally, we'd like our operation time to be 2.1 or better with our punters, uh, and that's the total operation time. Basically, with our punters, we'd like that operation time to be in the 1.3 or quicker segment. We also would like to have a uh, hang time of, you know, four seconds or better. That would be the ideal situation. One of the toughest things, I think, to do in college football is catch the punt, and particularly in the game when the people are coming down on you and you got to make decisions right there. Uh, it's very tough. I've asked my son Shane uh, to help us with this segment, and we're going to talk about catching a punt. I think the first thing is key the punter. If I'm a punt returner, the first thing I want to look at is the punter and see the direction that he's kicking the football. A lot of times they'll give you an idea where the ball is going before they actually kick the ball, just like a center fil uh, fielder would break on uh, the uh, batter hitting the ball. Uh, I think a punt returner needs to be moving in the direction the ball is going to be kicked. The next thing is, is position yourself on the ball and you really want to be square you really you want to catch every punt with your feet square so you can move in any direction I think that's a, a key part 
The next thing is you'd like to put that the, uh, ball, feel like it's coming right down on your nose. That's the position you'd want to be in, square and the ball looking like it's going to come down on your nose. Next I'd say to you, let me have the ball shame, is notice what kind of punt it is. If it's a sparrow, but it's not turned over, but it's a nice sparrow, then generally it's going to fall short and to your right. If it's a sparrow and it is turning over, then generally it's going to go deeper than you normally think. So what type of punt it is also gets into it. Now let's talk about actually catching a punt. Number one, you want to spread those fingers and you want to catch the ball in your hands. You notice Shane's elbows are into his side right now. That's where you want to be. And as you catch the ball in the hands, you give with the ball. In other words, you'll give and the ball will come right back into you and he'll notch it away. Look the ball in. That's another thing that a lot of punt returners forget to do. They want to know where they're going to run. Catch the ball with your hands, elbows in, give with it, and then look it in. Now you're ready to run. Now remember now, don't let that ball hit your chest first. Catch it with your hands, bring it into your body. A lot of people want the ball to hit their chest. Now all of a sudden now it's bouncing around and, and those are a lot tougher to catch. Now after you've caught that ball, Again, we talked about being square, and now that means you can take the first step where you want to go. And I think that's really important for a punt returner. What we teach, if we've got a side return, we got a, we're going to return it, say, to our right, we'd like for that punt returner to catch the ball square, and if he has time, step forward to draw the cover people to him. Now he's going to break hard to his right. And he can only do that if you catch the ball square, under control. Or if you've got a middle return, and you've caught it, you're square, we'd like to take a step to our side and then all of a sudden plant and come right back up the middle. In other words, setting up our blockers on cover people. And this again can only happen if you're catching the ball square. A couple of don'ts for that punt returner. Number one, don't attempt to handle a punt rolling unless you're facing the coverage and you have time to pick it up. If you're facing them, pick it up and let's go. The other possibility there is if you know you have a lot of time, you might catch it going away from you. But generally, Face the coverage people before you pick up a punt that's rolling. Our second don't is don't give the fair catch signal if you're not going to catch the punt inside your 10 yard line. In other words, when you give that fair catch signal, you're allowing people to run to the goal line and down the ball inside your 10. What we say to do is go in the general line of where that punt is going and act like you're going to catch the football, draw people to you, and hopefully the ball will bounce behind you and go on into the end zone. You get the ball back at, out at the 20. I've got some do's. You feel all punts in a game unless it's late in the game and you're leading and you got field position. Then you can let the ball hit the ground and consume time, but uh, that should be discussed on the sideline. Basically, you want to try to field every ball that you possibly can and not let it hit the ground. I think you make your decision to fair catch early and give the signal clearly, a couple of good waves with your hand. In other words, uh, you got to make that judgment and you should know how the people are coming down and now make that catch, fair catch signal and uh, don't leave it into the official's hands. I think a good punt returner has got to break a tackle. You know, you're talking about uh, a guy that uh, can do a good job of returning. First he needs to catch it, but then he's got to have the ability to break that first tackle and go. I think when you're talking about the sun, you align yourself with the sun so that you're actually looking away from it when you catch the football. So wherever the sun is, you align yourself with it, and then you actually try to put your back to it as you're catching the ball. And that way you're not looking directly into the sun. You can also put that hand over your eye to shade you, make sure it's stationary so that it doesn't become like a fair catch signal. And finally, you got to be in control. Usually, uh, most punt returners are back there by themselves. We use Peter to say, hey, the ball is going to be short. I'm going to fair catch it. Get out of my way. I don't want that ball hitting you in the head trying to block for me. But you've got to scream that out. You've got to get the people straight. And then the other thing, if the ball's on the ground rolling, it's a Peter call. So those people trying to block for you know to quit blocking, find the ball, and get away from it. You can help them by scream, Peter, Peter but then pointing to where the ball is so they've not got a general direction of where that uh, ball is. Peter, 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 Peter! You gotta be in control, you gotta make a good decisions back there, and then catch the ball and let's take it to the end zone. 
My name is Brian Steinspring. I coach the offensive line at Virginia Tech. From a special team standpoint, I'm in charge of the field goal protection unit, and I'm also in charge of the long and short snappers uh, here at Virginia Tech. We feel that uh, snapping is a, a very important part of special teams. It's a component that's often overlooked by many of the fans and, and attendance of the game until there's a mishap. Then it becomes a very critical part for everyone and concerned. There's several elements that we're going to look at in terms of snapping that uh, we hope will help you improve your snapping and consistency at that. There are six basic elements that we're going to talk about today in terms of snapping the uh, football. Uh, I got here with me uh, Steve Hale, who was a long snapper and short snapper for us several years ago, and he's going to help demonstrate some of the things that we're talking about. The first part of our stance and what we're hoping to accomplish is we want our feet parallel. We're not going to have a stagger. We want our feet slightly wider than shoulder width apart, and we want a little bow in our knees. And all we're trying to do in terms of that is allow ourselves to have a proper follow-through angle. We won't, we won't have a tight, any tightness in our stance to prevent a good follow through. The elevation of our hips is determined by whether we're going to short snap or long snap. If we're in a PAT, extra point situation, uh, we're going to be, our shoulders and our tail is going to be pretty much on the same level plane there. If we're, if we're going to snap into a long snap uh, routine on a punt, then, we're, uh, then our tail is going to be slightly higher than our shoulders to allow him to get the ball up and cover the distance that it needs to go. The second element in terms of snapping is the grip of the football. The first thing you want to try to do here is take your dominant hand and just like you're going to throw a football, grip the laces. Okay, the second hand, your off hand, what we're going to try to do is take our middle finger down the seam. Okay, and that gives it, and then we'll just roll it over. We'll take our dominant hand and we'll roll it over where the laces are down and the seam of our, in the middle finger is looking right back up at us. All we're trying to do with the laces in the, in the seam is to create rotation and spin on the football. Take it down to the ground there, Steve, and uh, see what it looks like from that standpoint. You want to roll the wrist over, keep the elbows in, the middle finger down the seam. It, it helps create more rotation and spin on the football. The part of the elbows in uh, and the middle finger, uh, why that is important than any other finger, it's because it keeps your elbows inside. And it's going to help you shoot your hands through when you go to deliver the ball. The third element of snapping that we're going to talk about now is the release and follow through. And we're going to do, have Steve Hale again demonstrate a drill that we're doing to try to take into uh, factor all the things that we're trying to teach here. He's going to keep a good base. Like he's in a snap situation, he's going to take the ball over his head. Okay, He's got his grip that we've worked on in his hand placement. And what he's trying to work on here is a good tight spiral on the football, throwing the palms outside and the thumbs down. I think it's a tremendous drill to get us uh, started off in terms of snapping instead of just jumping right down and snapping the football. Okay, let's go through a snap here. Again, snapping the ball about 10 yards. Now, the difference here, once we start making our snap, is that the thumbs are going to go up while the palms go outside. Good follow through. Again, we're going to try to watch and make sure that there is a good solid follow through, good snap of the wrist right there. And he's going to try to make those elbows hit those inside parts of his knees, just right there, what you're seeing. It's a good snap. Slow it down just a little bit here for me, Steve. There, good snap through. You see the thumbs up, palms outside, and you see that his uh, elbows are braced on the inside part of his knees. That's a good looking snap. The fourth element we're going to talk about is hip flexion. And the use of the hips is very important to us in terms of getting velocity on the football. What Steve's going to do here is our shoot drill. He's, he's going to drop the ball right below his helmet. He's going to pick it slightly off the ground. And that's going to encourage him to use his uh, buttocks and, and his hips to make this a good snap. You'll see his feet are going to give a little bit of ground back. He's going to create a little track. If he does this enough, there should be a little track, two parallel tracks. Right there, good. You see the tightening of the hips and then the release, and, there, and now your velocity starts. We believe this uh, helps our snappers develop the idea of what's going to get the ball back there. The next element is very simple. It's the execution of the snap. And what we're looking here and what we practice at Virginia Tech is addressing the football as a game situation. 
uh, in terms of uh, how you're going to come up to the line of scrimmage. Steve, come on in here. Again, he's going to come out. He's going to address the football just like a game situation, get the ball comfortably gripped. He's going to sight his target behind him, may check the defensive front, see what type of rush, recite, and snap it on a ready when he is ready. Boom. What we're talking about now is our field goal protection, our lineup, and some key factors that we're looking at in terms of protecting the, uh, our, our snap and protecting the ball is get it off in a, in a good operation. The guard, the center is going to get down, get set, then we're going to line up off the guard. We're going to try to get a nice little bow here. We're going to take a six inch split across the board here. Our inside foot's going to be back. Our outside foot's going to be at the heel of the guy inside. What we're going to do is get down a nice low stance. We're going to have a base a little wider than normal. The snap of the ball, we're keying the ball. Nothing makes us move except the snap of the football. So we're going to out of the corner of our eye, we're keying the snap of the ball. On the snap of the ball, we're stepping inside and shoulders are staying square. I got inside gap control, but I want to have a center line of gravity, which means I'm able to help my buddy outside while controlling my gap. If I turn my shoulders or lose my center line of gravity here, then I've opened up an additional running space, which we don't want to do. We want to be able to stay square, control my inside gap here, but be able to be firm enough outside where I'm not collapsing and getting, a, and, and getting run through, keeping my outside leg welded to the ground. Okay, Dan, can you step in here? Across the board, everything else is now simple. My outside foot, I'm keeping a six inch split. I will get into his instep with my outside foot, six inch split, slightly behind his heel. So when the ball snap, I'm now here behind his heel. Again, protecting my inside gap, but yet firm enough outside not to get washed down. Keeping your outside foot still, keeping a center line of gravity, and my shoulders square. Pads are down. Okay, Coach Foster. Moving out to the tight end spot. Exactly the same as a guard and tackle. Outside foot, working the uh, in step with the outside foot of my buddy. Six inch split, down a good stance, and again, on the snap of the ball, Boom, we're all working in unison. I control inside gap, and I'm pushing outside, okay, from this standpoint here. Okay, coach. Our wing, he's going to put his foot and his body down the midline of the tight end right here. And his responsibility is never to move that inside foot, protect this inside gap with the tight end. As our rusher tries to beat this gap here, I'm going to punch, impede his progress, ricochet back outside and make the outside rusher change his lane of rush. Okay, ready, man. That's our field goal protection. We've blocked a lot of kicks here at Virginia Tech, but no one has blocked more kicks than Keon Carpenter. He's now playing pro football, and he's back with us to help demonstrate some of the things we do. I think all of us would like to block kicks. The one thing we're afraid of is roughing the kicker. There's four things I think you uh, do to guard against that. Number one is a landmark. The landmark is so important. Our players will know exactly where that landmark is. We tell them this, and for any reason, if you get past that landmark, pull off. You're not going to block the kick this time. But what I, we have here is that you can run through this landmark full speed, and that's what you've got to be able to do to block kicks. We'll set the landmarks, let's say, eight yards. We always set it two yards in front of where the punter actually kicks the ball because you can adjust this way. In other words, I'd much rather be reaching out than have my body on a collision course with that punter. The punter's actually going to catch the ball or kick the ball at 10 yards. Our landmark is eight. That's where Keon will come to and then he'll adjust himself. So as we go through this thing right here, Keon will come to eight yards and then he'll adjust himself to the punter who's actually going to be kicking at 10. But we have freedom here that we're not going to rough the kicker. The next thing is the angle to the football. You never put your body on a collision course with the kicker. If you're coming from the left side, you're going to come across and go right on through the blocking area full speed. Okay? You've got to feel like you've got the ability to run through that block area full speed and not rough the kicker, not be on a collision course with the punter. Next, if you're coming from the right side, you do the same thing and go across. In other words, uh, go to, be able to go through that blocking area full speed. Now the tricky thing is if you're coming up the middle and you always want to come off to the kicker's foot. If you're on this side, 
your head on with the, uh, the punter, all right, then we'll come across and come off to the kicker's foot. We never want to put ourselves on a collision course with that punter. If we're coming from this side, it's just the opposite. We'd come across, and now he's going to come across to the kicker's foot. Never putting himself on a collision course with that punter. Next thing you want to do is stay on your feet. We never leave our feet to block a kick. Because as long as your feet's on the ground, you can adjust yourself back here. But once you dive up in the air, you would never see us do that because once you've done that, you're at their, their mercy. We want to be under control. We're not going to block every kick, but we're going to feel good that we're not going to rough the punter. Come through properly this time, Ken. As long as his feet's on the ground, then he can adjust himself into whichever direction he needs to go. The last thing I'd say to you, if you're blocked, stop and work outside. If we're rushing eight people, we want seven of them blocked. We only want one person back here running through this uh, blocking lane back here. If we've got two, then they're trying to avoid each other. They're uh, liable to run into each other and then all of a sudden rough the kicker. We only want one person free back here. So what will happen here, come on in and help me, Coach Steinspring. If Keon is blocked, all right, He's going to go like he's going to uh, rough, or going to uh, go like he's going to block the kick. Now, if he's blocked, I want him to stop, start working outside, keep that area free back there. Now, what's going to happen one of these days is that punter's going to pull the ball down. He realizes the ball is going to be blocked. He starts running. Keon's going to be out here to make the tackle. The next thing that's going to happen is that some one of these days. The ball will be blocked back there. The ball comes out to Keon's side right here. Now he picks up the ball and goes to the end zone. So there's a lot of reasons why if you're blocked, stop, work to the outside. Those are the four things I think that says, okay, we're not going to rough that kicker, and that's really important. We've talked about uh, not roughing the kicker, but now let's talk about the actual techniques. First thing I go into is the stance. And what we'd like to do is get our uh, foot back as far as we can. We get our hand down, and, and it's just like a sprinter. In other words, we've got to be come, out, come out of this thing very fast. The ne next thing I'd tell you is we're going to put the ball right here on the line. Let's put it on this line right here. Now Keon can put his hand down on that line, and this is how we practice. All right. Now we know we're as close to that ball as we possibly can. Keon will get his head back behind his hand. Now he knows he's on side. Now he can turn his full attention to that football and when it's going to be snapped. And that's the next important thing, get off. A lot of times uh, snappers will start squeezing the ball a little bit, their hands start turning a little bit white. Some snappers will hitch the ball a little bit, they'll take the ball up in the air uh, slightly. All those things are keys to get you off. So you need to be able to concentrate on keying that football so you get the best jump possible. The first five yards are the most critical in blocking a kick. That's where the, you got to be just like a sprinter. So when that ball snapped, those first five yards, a lot of people want to come out and see what's going to happen, see if a hole opens up. But you can't do that. You got to come out of here expecting to go free, nice and low, just like a sprinter would be, expecting to go free and make up ground during this part of the time. The next thing, we never want to get our hands up to the very last second. A lot of people about right here want to start throwing their hands up in the air. Now you can't run as fast as you normally would. So Keon would never put his hands up till he gets all the way back here to the punter, all right? And at the very last second, his hands will go from his hips to right there. That's as far as it is. It's not up in the air any further. It's a very quick move, very fast move. So that's, uh, that's the uh, next thing. All right, and then after that, it's all, where are your eyes? Two things can't happen. We can't turn our head as we get back here, and we can't close our eyes when we get back here. Now, if Keon turns his head back here, all right, or he turns his body back here, he can't be on this team. He wouldn't do that. He'll look right there at that foot, all right? That's, that's, he knows his landmark. He can come through here full speed. Now, you look right there at that foot. He'll keep his eyes open. He'll never close his eyes. And then he'll put his hands right on the foot at the very last second. He'll put his hands on the foot at the very last second. And that's the seven techniques to block a kick. People all the time ask us, uh, show us all the drills you use to teach uh, blocking kicks. And it's one. We only use one drill. This is it. We do it two or three times a week. We practice this a lot because your uh, punt blockers got to feel comfortable back here uh, when they get around that punter. 
So this is the one we use. And to set it up, uh, we use a softball. We take some of the air out of the ball right there so guys are not hurting their hands when they come through here. And then after that, we have a snapper. He'll have that ball on the line just like we talked about earlier. Uh, we, put the, we always work with a line there so we know we're on sides. We get uh, lined up. He'll snap it actually to a person back here. And I like that because, again, those hands start tightening a little bit. You get, uh, you're working on getting a, a jump on the ball. And then he'll snap it back here to a punter who will kick a ball at 10 yards. This is the drill that we use. His hands stay down to the very last second, all right? And now he takes his, takes his zone uh, approach. In other words, he's going to go upfield and then redirect to the landmark. That's a good way to practice. Make his body small, all right? And then here he comes, exploding through to block the kick. This is part of the game I really enjoy working with. I think a couple things you look for is a guy that really has explosive get off. That makes uh, such a difference, a guy that can really get a jump on the ball. Next thing is guys that's got speed, and it really helps if they got height or long arms, because again, when you get back here, if you don't block the kick, it's always about you missed it by about that much. So if those arms are a little bit longer, if you can make up some distance along the way with your speed, then that's the difference in, in blocking a kick or not blocking it. So those are the things that I think are important. I think this is a critically, uh, a uh, big part of the game of uh, football. If you can block a kick, you can turn a game around in a hurry. I'd like to show you a zone approach, a real simple one that we use here at Virginia Tech to blocking a punt. Uh, it involves stretching those zones that we talked about outside, but this is uh, what I'm talking about. What we want to do is stretch this side right here. So we would have five, for example, to work his way right behind that center, get as far to the inside as he can, and work to his landmark. We would like for four to either start out outside and then jump back inside, but again, stretching that area right there. He could start out inside and work straight up the field and then redirect to his landmark. What we would tell three here is to work up field until that tackle can no longer block you and once he can't block you, then bend hard, almost running away from this slot to go to your landmark, to the blocking point. We would tell two, take a step and try to go one, one step outside of where this slot can get his hand on you. And as soon as you get to where he can't get his hand on you, bend hard for your landmark. So that would be a zone stretch, trying to block a punt approach uh, for us here at Virginia Tech. Let's show you what I'm talking about on the video. All right, you'll notice right here, notice this is two, three, four, five. This is going to be our zone approach right here. We'll start the video, and you'll notice this guy will jump to the inside. Notice uh, number 82 right here, starting outside, but jumping back inside. We're trying to stretch that zone right there. Notice 83 here going upfield and then bending hard for his landmark. And, also, and the outside guy is going to get blocked. But you'll notice... We free up one right here. He takes the ball right off his foot, looks right at it, and that's how you block a kick. Here's a great shot of what we teach taking the ball off the foot. You're going to see a guy come from the outside right here, take it right off his foot, and actually, it never hits the ground. The only thing that's wrong here, he gets his hands up in the air a little too long. They don't need to be up there. He can't run quite as fast as he could if his hands were down by his side. But the thing he does, he looks at the ball and takes it right off the guy's foot and he takes it to the end zone. We talked about Keon Carpenter, his great athletic ability and what he could do. Here's uh, Keon in action. And of course, as we said earlier, he's our leading pump blocker here at Virginia Tech. And as you can see, he had to dodge a guy. He shows great athletic ability right here. And then again, he puts, he puts his hands right on the kicker's foot, takes it right off the, the foot. We'll see that from behind. I think you'll even get a better look here of Keon in action. Here he is, moving around a little bit before the ball is snapped, trying to get a good jump on the football. He gets him a good jump, has to do a nice juke move. And as you can tell, Again, he's got his eyes right on that foot and puts his hands right on that foot and another block kick. 
Another shot of Keon Carpenter, again, his great explosion off the ball, his good athletic ability, again, putting his hand right on the kicker's foot, again, going off to the kicker's side where there's no chance he's going to have a rough in the punter penalty, all those things that we teach here. Again, you'll see him make himself small as he avoids this center. You know, he's not giving him a full surface to block. He's turned his shoulders a little bit to avoid the center. And all those things are key ingredients in blocking kicks. Here's a look at our base field goal and PAT block on video. What we have here is our, our block left. Our backer has come out of here a little bit early uh, to check the eligible receiver. But the thing that you see right here, we're all in sprinter stances. You know, if he's up here in this position, it'd be hard to tell if we're coming block right or block left. Uh, and it should look that way. Uh, but the thing that we've got here, we've got good uh, sprinter stances. Our hands are out in front of our head. Uh, they're all focusing in on the football, keying that football to get a great jump on the ball. Now, we're getting great movement. Let's just take the inside look. We take, get these two guys right here. Now, the second guy in really doesn't get a great jump, but we have good pad level here where we're getting good movement. All right, now what we want to do is get these guys to get big. All right, and now hopefully get their hands up and get in the flight of the ball right here. All right, now what happens is here when you get great get off and you get two working one, that tackle feels like he's got to step down and help those, that guard. And now what that does is allows our, our stud end to get great penetration right here. He does a good job, again, of making himself small. But basically what we're going to do is we're going to take really three and work them over two and create a mismatch there and now allow us to get penetration and allow us to block kicks. This would be an example of our getting penetration with our two inside guys. Good pad level right here. And now what we want to do as soon as we get penetration, we want to get up and get vertical and get big. All right? And now we've, we've created a wall right here. And now number 96 puts his big paw up there and gets a piece of that football. Now, we, this is again, we want to be good about getting broke down right here. And that ball ricochets to you. We want to be in a position to go and get that ball and take it the other way. And now it's points for us. Let's take a look here uh, real quick at our extra point field goal protection. You see our lineup six inch splits that we've talked about already. Uh, pads are down, foot, uh, inside foot is a little bit behind, so we're able to step inside and get behind our buddy next to us. So we'll take a look here at, uh, at our operation, how things work. Good operation time, our kicker gets the ball up very well. Really good shoulder, that's a good center line of gravity right there. Everything's right down the pipe. He's stepping inside, but he's not turning his shoulders. He's staying square. This uh, wing guy here is doing a good job of keeping his inside foot punching off at the end right here. It's a good job of getting a good snap on the ball here by everyone stepping in unison. Another look at a uh, different type of rush. Again, a nice job by your wing guy. You're being patient a little bit. Tight end's dropping his hat here some but knocking him off his course. See it better from this angle? Again, good pad level, good shoulder square, inside gap control, being, just helping your buddy out with your outside hand by pushing back outside. But a nice job here of knocking off course by your slot. At Virginia Tech, we feel that if our execution is good every time. And I, mean, I talk about execution in terms of blocking up front and handling our assignments and the operation time between the center and the holder and the kicker, then we should never get a field goal block. I want to take a little time and go over our pump protection here at Virginia Tech. We're a little bit different in the fact that we're a zone protection concept across the board. Again, let me show you the diagram on the board. And we start with our formation. We're a spread formation, kind of a conventional like everybody else. Let's talk about our splits. At the guard position, we'll use a six inch split. At the tackle, we'll use a foot or 12 inches. At the wing position, we'll be lined up on our outside foot four yards from the ball. So four yards in depth this way, that way. Our personal protectors at five yards deep, 
Our punters at 13 yards deep. Our wing people are two yards above the numbers on the line of scrimmage. That basically is our alignment to start off with, and that's where we start. From there, we're a zone concept. And in order to make our pump protection work, there's probably two vital things. First off, that we get a little bit of depth off the football so we'll set and bend off our alignment. And when our helmet splits, the number of the center. This allows us to get off the, back off the football. Secondly, we set straight back, that everybody works together setting straight back or vertical, working together. The same way or concept that two offensive linemen switch off in pass protection on, on, a, on a defensive line pass twist is the same way we'll work here. Everybody's responsible for their outside gap, but we like to hold space or help our wingman inside by making our inside hand available. Our center snaps it on command, gets big, and then gets out in the zone. Our personal protector has really eyeballs both A gaps and hunkers in anything inside for us. Again, off of our set, if for instance, if I'm a left guard, we have our outside foot back, our tail down, and as we set straight back, we give ground grudgingly. We're responsible for our outside gap so we look at our outside gap punching through our widest moats, but we feel with our inside hand any threat in this A gap. The same mirrored protection is true for our tackle and our wing, being responsible for the outside gap, but yet they feel or help inside with an inside feel hand. Here's an example of our pump protection on videotape. Notice our splits at the guard position are six inch. We're a foot here. Again, we're aligned with his outside foot four yards from the ball. Our head hunters are not on the screen because we've got an inside or an end zone shot. Upon command, we snap the football. We've got a left-footed punter, so therefore our personal protector is on the left side. Everybody sets back, straight, working vertical. Again, responsible for the outside gap, punching through their gap. Everybody shuffles and sets, giving ground grudgingly. If anything here, the right side, everybody's in pretty good shape. If anybody's in a little bit poor shape, it's a left tackle. He sets out a little bit, and there's an example of air, or a little bit too much air, in the B gap there. Once everybody's got their, their man stopped and makes him restart, we escape and get into our coverage lanes and get down the field. Take time out and show you a couple shots of our kickoff return. And this is our alignment here at Virginia Tech. We have five guys across the front. We have two tight ends, a fullback, two halfbacks, and a tailback. Our basic thing is we want to expect the unexpected. Always assume for an onside kick or a squib or a sky kick, we want to see the ball off the tee, any of these front five. The next thing that's probably is much important for these guys is their drop. They've got to understand where we're trying to run the football and also get back to their landmark turn and attack on the guy that they're responsible for. We're a count protection and, and a wedge scheme as well. Uh, we count from left to right just like you would read. Each of these guys are responsible for a number. They've got to understand angles of the game as they drop back, get to a point, and then go attack the guy they're responsible for. Upon attacking them, we, we use three things. We say fit, form, and run. We want to fit up on the defender, we want to form in on him, and we want to run our feet on contact, staying up with him, taking him where he wants to go, creating these guys back here uh, a, a lane to run in. Let's run the film right quick. Again, they see it off the front foot. Here's an example of a guy taking a drop. He wants to drop approximately to the 28-yard line. He gets inside. He fits up on the guy. Gets his drop, he goes and attack, he fits him, he forms, he runs his feet. Another one staying up up front. This happens to be in our scheme of things, a wedge return. The back line's got a wedge principle here where they get shoulder to shoulder on a go call. They're going north and south. Here's another shot of it, kickoff return. Again, our alignment is the same. We don't vary much with that. Again, expect the unexpected up front. We see the ball kick. Here's a good example of somebody getting up on that front line and staying with them, creating a seam and the, the punt and the kickoff returner going north and south. We don't want to go east and west here in this phase of the football game.
Here's a good example of a guy getting inside of the man he's responsible for. They drop to a spot, get square, go attack, fit form and run your feet. And it doesn't take a great killer block. It's just basically a shield and the, and the kickoff returner does the rest. In our kickoff uh, coverage, we have three groups of people. We have headhunters, we have coverage people, we have safeties. We would call this uh, kickoff coverage right here 138. One stands for the guy that's going to be the safety along with our kicker. The, our kickoff would be a, our safety, and then one, the first number, would be the safety also. This is one, and we'd number across. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Kicker right there. So it's 138. So one is a safety along with the kicker. Three and eight are headhunters. The rest of the guys, two, four, five, six, seven, nine, and ten are coverage people. Now let me explain real quickly what's the difference. The headhunters, three and eight, their mission is to be the first one down the field and make the ball change direction. We don't want a ball to run directly to the end zone. They will go their, their path down the field. They decide that. They want to get on a head-up collision course with the ball as quickly as possible. If they don't make the tackle, that's OK as long as the ball changes direction. So that's the, uh, what our headhunters do. All right, our safety, what they want to do is sprint down the field get five to ten yards away from the action and then be in a control be in a control position and keep the ball between them in other words if it breaks out of there then they're going to make the tackle now the coverage people it's seven people involved right there this is our point guy right here and what he should do is go directly to the football all right the next three guys should keep it on their inside shoulder all right this would be our contained guy here, number two, all right? So our point guy, go right to it, keep it on your inside shoulder, keep it on your inside shoulder, and contain and keep it on the inside shoulder. Same thing over here, keep it on the inside shoulder, keep it on the inside shoulder, contain and keep it on the inside shoulder. Now their rules are different in this regard. When you get within five to 10 yards of the ball carry, if you've got a blocker between you and that ball carry, You'll get squared up on that blocker and then squeeze to the next guy over. You won't take a side where you open up a gap. So in other words, we're going to stay square on blockers once we've got to the five or 10 yards distance away from the ball carrier. So you know these are the people we fully expect to make the tackle. We don't want them to, to run themselves out of a lane and not make a tackle. So let's roll this thing and we'll see how this thing turns out. Again. We've got our headhunter right here, number eight. And notice how he just goes directly to the ball. And, in, and not only does he break up this wedge, but he makes the ball carrier change directions. We don't want to just go down here and give ourselves up, but we also want that ball carrier to change directions. You know my, notice my headhunter on the other side, number three. He's, again, leading the pack down there, going directly to the football, working his way through there. He ended up getting blocked but somebody else is going to take his place. Notice my two safeties. We'll run this back. And notice my two safeties. Number one. And we'd like for him to get on down the field. And again, he and the key kicker will keep the ball between them. That ball should stay right between those two guys, and they move with it as the ball moves. Then everyone else is coverage guys. And these are guys are, again, if you've got a blocker in front of you, break down. If you don't, keep on going. So here we got a return. We're going to block numbers up front. We've got a wedge behind. We break up the wedge. We make the ball run sideways. And here we go. Our people converge on the football and make the tackle inside the 20-yard line. And that is for sure, if you can make them start, start inside the 20-yard line, you really gain an advantage. Here it is from behind. Again, there's our head hunter. Here's our head hunter. They take direct courses right to the football. Get yourself on a collision course with that ball. In other words, that guy was on a good collision course. We make the ball run sideways, and then we uh, 
we uh, make the tackle. One more thing I'd point out to you is generally the direction people try to block you, you want to go in the opposite direction. In other words, right here we have a guy, and this guy's trying to block him to this side. Well, he's going to cross his face now. He needs to get back and get his position on the ball. But whatever way they're trying to block you, you generally want to cross their face opposite. We don't want to go in the direction that they're trying to block us. I hope you've gotten something out of the information that uh, we've talked about here. I appreciate my coaches being involved. We believe in special teams here at Virginia Tech. And if you're going to be successful, you've got to believe in it. You've got to believe in it to the point where you work at improving your skills. You've got to believe in it as a, as a team to work to improve uh, whatever area you, you're talking about. But if you'll put the effort into it, if you'll uh, take some of the things that we've talked about, apply them, I really think it'll help you be a better special teams player and as a result win uh, more football games. So hopefully we've been of some help. I think if I had to say one word to say what's important to be a great college football player, I'd use the word relentless. I've always liked that word. I uh, use it a lot, but relentless in your efforts to become a great football player, your workout habits. Uh, you can't, uh, can't be a good uh, player two days a week. It's, you know, it's got to be your, your got a schedule there as far as your workouts, and you're going to stay on that schedule and not miss one, one workout. You're relentless in your effort to get yourself better. And then when you get to the field, you're relentless and you'll just never give up. You're, you'll play the next play just as hard as you possibly can play it. You'll forget about that last play and get on to the next play and play it as hard as you can possibly play it. Do it focused and do it as well as you possibly can do it and as hard as you possibly can do it. And you're going to do that. You just absolutely will not give up. You're relentless in your efforts to be successful. And to me, that's what, what it's all about. Regardless of your talent level, uh, you, you're going to contribute to this football team if you are relentless in your actions. I think as you go along, you, you know, wins is what's make, well, what uh, makes it. It's uh, whether you can win or not determines whether you can stay in the sport or not. So certainly that has to be there. And I would like to think that, you know, we fundamentally we were sound here at Virginia Tech and, and we won a lot of football games. But what I'd really want people to think about Frank Beamer is that he respected them. He respected uh, the game that we were playing. He tried to make that better. And then there was respect uh, off the field, on the field, after the game, before the game. Um, uh, I just feel like the respect for other people is, is an important ingredient. I think in this country right now, you can look around and, and that's a lot of our problems is that people don't respect other people. And, and uh, you can, it kind of goes right back to that's, that's where the problems start. And, and uh, I would want to be known as a person that really did respect other people in this profession. One of my main thoughts that I uh, talk about a lot is the saying, nothing's ever as good as it seems, nothing's ever as bad, but somewhere in between is reality. And, and that's something I really believe, whether it's, it's football games, whether it's life, but doing it on an even keel. Don't be on that emotional roller coaster where you're up and down. One day you're good, next day you're bad. But, you know, you lose a football game. Well, you're right back to work, and let's get ready to win the next football game. If you win a great game, all of a sudden you're not uh, uh, liking the success so much that you don't prepare for the next football game, and all of a sudden you're not playing well there. I really believe that when you think about it, when things are good, they're not as good as you, you think that is, they are. And when they're bad, they're not as bad as you think they are. But somewhere in between is real reality. And I think if we can just live our life like that and just keep approaching life like that, approach the next day like that, then you have a better chance of success in life. I really enjoyed being a part of this series, being on here with such great coaches as, as we are. And you know all of us, I think, uh, have a common goal here. We really like the game of football, we want to help the game of football, we want to do what we can to make it better and hopefully through this series myself and these other great coaches have helped you. I hope you've enjoyed this tape by Frank Beamer and his assistants. Uh, Frank at Virginia Tech has really resurrected that program 
And one of the strong points of Virginia Tech football over the re years, particularly recent years, has been their special teams. And we thought there was no finer coach in the country than Frank to talk about this area of play. So we hope you've benefited and learned a great deal from this tape. This Legends of the Game video is one in a series of instructional tapes made for coaches, athletes, parents, and fans of the game of football. There are a total of 10 tapes available covering all aspects of football. We sought out the best coaches in the country in order to produce top quality instructional tapes. If you would like to order additional videos or receive more information about the Legends of the Game series, call 800-230-3831 or write us at Coaches Direct in Lincoln, Nebraska. You may also fax us at area code 402-465-8849, or you can visit us on our website at www.coachesdirect.com. Thank you for your interest in the game of football.